Wie schön, dass du heute wieder dabei bist. In der heutigen englischen Folge erzählt Yoshito einige ganz spannende Dinge aus seinem dreisprachigen Familienleben. Zum Beispiel, wie es ihm dabei geht, die koreanischen Gespräche zwischen seiner Frau und den Kindern kaum zu verstehen und wie seine Kinder lesen und schreiben in gleich drei Sprachen lernen. Apropos, wenn du möchtest, dass dein Kind lesen und schreiben in mehr als einer Sprache lernt, aber nicht weißt, worauf du achten musst und wie du daran am besten herangehst, dann habe ich jetzt noch ein spontanes Angebot für dich. Aufgrund zahlreicher Anfragen mache ich meinen Online-Workshop Lesen und Schreiben in zwei Sprachen am 19. Juni zum zweiten Mal. Er findet von 17 bis 18.30 Uhr auf Zoom statt und anmelden kannst du dich über den Link in den Show Notes. Jetzt aber viel Spaß bei der heutigen Folge. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Multilingual Stories. Today's guest is known as Multilingual Dad on Instagram and his name is Yoshito Darman Shimamori. I'm really pleased to have him here today and I'm super curious about his story. I've been following him on Instagram for quite a while, but I don't actually know too much about his background. And we will also talk about a book that he recently published that I'm sure will be of interest to many of you. Hi, Yoshito. Hello, Bettina, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background first? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Yoshito. I am half French, half Japanese. So my mom is Japanese. My dad is French. I was born in France and grew up in France, so lived all my life in France until I left at 23 uh, to come to England, where I live now. Um, and so I live uh, so with my wife, who's Korean, and we're raising our two children um, trilingual, so French, Korean, and English. So okay. I speak with them in French, my wife in Korean, and English is from school and all the surrounding. I'm, I'm super curious, so I need to back up a little. Yeah. How come you left uh, France? Uh, well, it's mainly for, I would say, job reasons, uh, because I wanted to become a, a French teacher, so teaching French, but to foreign people, so coming mm -hmm. to France and helping them integrate the French culture as mm -hmm. well, because what I like about teaching languages is not just the language but the all the cultural aspects yes. uh, that goes with it but in france if you work as a that type of that type of teacher so it's french as a foreign language uh it's like you're not paid well it's really difficult to find jobs uh mm -hmm. and because i came already to england quite a few times like my parents were really into Uh, making sure that their children speak English as well because it's mm -hmm. an international language. So they sent us several times to England on summer camps and I like the country, so I thought, why not? And yeah, and here I am. Great. So you met, I have so many questions now. <laughs> so, so many open, oops, so many open loops now for me. So you met your wife in England? Uh, no, we met no. in France. So she, she came to France to, to study first French and she's doing embroidery. And, uh, so she was doing fashion design. So she came to France to study it and we met then. And then I, I, I did a PGC. So to become a, a language teacher in England and it had to be in London or in England. So I came to England while she was living in Paris. We were living for one year apart like that. And mm -hmm. then she joined me in England. Okay. Cool. That's so interesting. <laughs> so one thing that I find really striking about your story is you mentioned that, well, for you, it's not just teaching a language. For you, it is the entire cultural background that comes with the yeah. language. And as you probably know by now, you know, this is one of the things that I, that I really did to my heart because... Um, in most cases, multilingual children are also multicultural children. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a super important aspect that we cannot deny in quite the opposite. We need to focus on it. Yeah. And we need to focus on the gift that we're giving our children, not just with the languages, but with the cultures as well. Yeah. And with 
them becoming these bridge builders, natural bridge builders between the cultures, which I think is just amazing and has huge potential for our world. Yeah. So I find it so fascinating that you coming exactly from a family like that, a family, you know, the kind of family that we're talking about anyways. And this has become, this was so obvious to you yeah. um, because you grew up with it. Yeah. Do you agree with yeah. that, with that angle yeah. on, on, on I, your story? Yeah, I completely resonate with everything you said. And that like, as multilingual children, we have to, to make a bridge between cultures. And that's how I felt since I was very little. I remember like once when we went to Japan to see my family, uh, one of my mom's friends, a French friend came and she's one of her first friends uh, when she went to France. So my grandmother really wanted to thank her for helping her daughter, etc. Mm -hmm. And but my grandmother could just speak uh, Japanese, so she said everything in Japanese. And my mom's friend spoke a little bit of Japanese, but not enough to understand mm -hmm. all my grandmother wanted to say. So with my brother, we're in the middle translating from wow. one person to the other, and it really made me feel like I could help people communicate and like yeah. transmit how much like my grandmother was grateful and all these kind of really important things. And also I had like one of my best friends was Japanese, uh, but he was living in Japan. And once he came to France to visit us and my best friend in France was half French, half Italian. Uh, but so we were playing all together and because we were kids, we didn't really need words. Mm -hmm. But sometimes to understand each other, I was here trying to to make the conversation flow. And yeah, so I, I have loads of memories of me being a bridge. And I can see how empowering it can be to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And also because the French culture and Japanese culture is quite different. Yes. Um, I grew up in France. So for me, the French culture is very natural. But the Japanese one is... So from my mom, I got a bit, but when I went to Japan, there were still some cultural shocks about things I didn't understand. And that's when my mom explained to me how it worked in Japan. And so I think it's as, because it's part of us, we want to understand both and we want to link both as well. And like you said, like children who grew up that way, they are the people who are going to enable communication yes. between cultures and yeah that's quite important so for me and now i want to transmit this yeah. to my children that's amazing and the other thing that i find fascinating and you just mentioned it yourself um although so many thoughts again wow <laughs> this is really inspiring so um you know, there are certain cultures where we like kind of know there is going to be a huge difference. So yeah. we know that between the French and the Japanese culture, okay, that, that's like worlds in between. We kind of expect that. So you have you have an amazing worldview, basically, because you, you've got two cultures that are really different, which, you know, I think is a real gift. On the other hand, I myself experienced something that really, really surprised me. And not in a good way. Oh. Because there are cultures where we expect it to be very similar to ours. Ah, so okay. for my PhD, I moved to the Netherlands. Um, and I expected to, you know, it, it's a European country. And I thought, well, you know, how different can it be? Yeah. And it turned out in tiny things that added up, it was so different that I feel like the culture shock was almost bigger than if I had gone there expecting like, you know, going to Japan for a year or to study, you know, you go there with the mindset, oh, I'm going to learn so many new things about a yeah. different culture. I need to adjust. Yeah. But going to a country and thinking, oh, you know, that, you know, we're all basically, we, we have the same background, but we don't. Yeah. And I find that also that that was something that really struck me that I hadn't been aware of before yeah. that yeah i had the same when i came to england like it's really close and but see there's so many things that are different in people's <laughs> attitude in the way they phrase things and even like the behavior is different 
Yeah. And yeah. what's normal is different from one country to another. Yes. Yeah. We need to adapt to that. Yes. Normal is, anyways, it's a weird concept um, of what is normal and what isn't. <laughs> So I'm really curious now, of course, also about Japanese. So you said, well, you were translating for your grandmother between um, Japanese and French. Um, but from what I heard now, you're not passing, you're currently not passing on Japanese to your children. No. <laughs> How come? So so I, I speak, so I grew up with French and Japanese, but because I grew up in France, my French is mm. much, much more fluent than my Japanese. And also now I lost a lot because I'm not really using it. Mm. Uh, but also what made me just choose Jap uh, French is that when I had my first son or when I, before that, when I started thinking about it, not how I was going, what I was going to speak, but my mom always told me, uh, a language is a way to communicate with people. So if you speak one language, uh, they'll understand with you, they speak that way. If, uh, so my wife speaks another language, they understand with mom is that, that language, but you can't speak two languages. And that's what she thought. That's what she told me. And at the time, because like raising children with, with multiple languages was quite natural for me because I grew up that way. I didn't really research it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, okay. So it's logical. Yeah. French is easier for me. So I'm just going to speak French. Makes sense. Them. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, I really started being curious about multilingualism uh, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when I started to see, okay, there are other ways to raise yeah. children with multiple languages. Mm -hmm. And they like, we were following the OPO method. So one parent, one language. And I realized that you can raise a child with other ways as well. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be one parent with one language. Mm -hmm. It can be one parent with two languages. It can be other different models. Um, yeah. So, but I don't regret it because well, there is no way, well, no reason to regret. Like if no, I, if I wanted to no change, way. I could just change it. But yeah, for me, it's comfortable that way. And if I had to pass on two languages with the amount of time I have with them, for me, it would mean more organization in of terms course. of when I would speak which language. Uh, and also, I want them to be able to read in all their languages. Mm. So already I'm doing French, Korean with them, uh, with the help of the school and my wife. Uh, but I, I feel it would be too much for me. So I'm happy with the setting. No, I completely understand what's, um, I mean, the most important point is that the whole family needs to be at ease with the system that they yeah. have. You know, you need to be happy with it and you need to be able to handle it. So wait, Korean? So you speak Korean too? <laughs> Not really. No. So no. you're learning Korean alongside them, the yeah. reading and the, the writing. So for a long time, I've been a passive learner. Mm -hmm. So my wife was always speaking to our children in Korean since they were like in, in the belly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I picked up little by little what she was saying. Uh, and yeah, until like recently, I haven't studied it. I just picked up mm -hmm. sentences. And when we go to Korea, I try to use that like, to put chunks together mm -hmm. to communicate. Uh, but it's really basic. And about two months ago, I started taking formal lessons oh, cool. uh, to understand a bit more about the grammar. And it helps a lot because mm. I have all this knowledge that's not organized, but having the grammar helps me organize things. Yes, I'm completely so. the same. I'm completely the same. My husband also thinks that I don't need formal instruction in Greek. And I always <laughs> think, no, but, but I do, because then I read it and then I'm like, you know, then I can connect the dots much better yeah. than by just, you know, I picked up a lot by just hearing it, but I, I still want the, the formal part of it too. Yeah. So um, now I have a question that I know interests a lot of families because I get the question all the time. So you don't speak Korean. Um, your wife does speak French. Yeah. Um, when you're all together at the table, which language does your wife use with the children? So she speaks Korean with them, 
they speak Korean to her. They speak uh, French to me. I speak French to them. And between my wife and me, it's uh, in French as well because she, she's fluent mm-hmm. in French. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and between my children, it can be in English. So it's three languages at the table. Yes. And I'm the only one who doesn't understand all of them. Okay. Now, so here's a really important question. I get this all the time. And what you are doing, I think it's amazing. And it's basically what I recommend people to do. Yeah. And then the question comes, yeah, but then he doesn't understand me and he doesn't understand what I'm telling the children. How is that for you? How does it make you feel to not always understand so, what they what they talk? And how do you handle these situations? So I think first we need to get comfortable with not understanding all the details, but there is a lot we can understand with just a little. So for example, the situation, the context tells you a lot about it. Then the gestures, uh, the ex- facial expressions, tone of voice, you can guess a lot from there. Then you just need to pick a few key words and then you understand most of the situation. And so let's say they speak in Korean. I intervene in French. Uh, and most of the time it, it goes with the conversation. They understand and it's logical and why well, it means that I understood what they were saying. And, but when it's not the case, my wife or my sons correct me and they say, Oh no, that's what I, not what I meant. This is what I meant. And yeah, and I guess it becomes a habit and maybe also I'm not really, I don't really mind not understanding everything. And maybe it's because I've been learning different languages, mm. like English. Like when I came to England, I couldn't really speak English. I learned it in school, but it's not like enough to have a proper conversation. Same for Spanish. So Korean I understand it even less, but I, I I don't mind. And I love this so much. I love this so much. It's it's a challenge that many have. And I think there's, I mean, there's at least two sides. The one is the challenge that the the parent who's not being understood mm. has the challenge of what is he gonna think? Ah uh, yeah. Or what is she gonna think? And often it's just something that they haven't actually talked about. Like they think that the other one is going to object or not like it or be uncomfortable, but they yeah. haven't actually talked about it. or haven't actually made the decision yeah. um, to do something about it. And the other thing is that, you know, I find what's really important is that both partners are on the same, on the same right. side and that they yeah. agree, you know, and, and you both have this understanding that it's important to you to pass on your languages. Yeah. Um, which is really, really important, but there are still parents who struggle because they don't actually agree. And the partner doesn't actually agree on, you know, how important it is to pass on all the languages. And that's when it becomes really challenging. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just thinking of my brother because he grew up half French, half Japanese like me, uh, and he's married to a Japanese woman. Um, But... She doesn't speak French. She just picked up a few words, but very little. And he was worried that she wouldn't leave it. uh, She wouldn't cope with it, like not understanding what he was saying. And, but he hasn't actually, he hadn't actually talked to her. Mm -hmm. And then I said, so I'm in the situation of your wife. That's how I'm, I'm living it. I picked up the language along the way. There's a lot you can understand, et cetera, et cetera. And then he became a bit more comfortable. He talked to his wife about it and she was more than fine. So sometimes just yeah. having the courage to speak to yeah. the, the partner and to say, so that's what I'm thinking or that's what I'm planning to do. What do you think about it? Yeah. Sometimes we're on the same page. It's natural, but sometimes we need this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That is, thank you so much for this contribution. So I didn't know this about you and your family, but I'm so glad that I got to talk to somebody <laughs> on the podcast about this topic because it's such a struggle for so many families. Yeah. So you said um, 
So one of the things that I always do when I start working with a family and something that I always, I say it everywhere, you know, you can find it on Instagram. One of the things that are really basic for me um, for multilingual life to be successful um, is to be very clear about your goals for the individual languages. Once you're clear about the goals you have for the languages, then you can set a strategy on how yeah. to achieve these goals. And you can maybe also do a reality check and see whether this is even reasonable or whether I this do. is a goal that's actually, you know, within reach um, in a certain amount of time. Because I, I believe at the end of the day, you know, you can reach any goal also with the languages, um, yeah. just the, the amount of time and the amount of energy you put into it, you know, needs, needs to be in proportion. Yeah. So for you, it was really clear that you had the goal of um, having biliteral or triliterate children, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that process. How do how do you go about that? So the children they learn to read and write in English at school, I suppose. Yeah. Um, how old then, are your children, by the way? Uh, five and my and has just turned eight yesterday. Right. Oh wow. Okay, so you have you have to cater to different age groups as well. Yeah. So you teach French and Korean at home. Uh, yeah. So mainly French, Korean a bit. So. I started teaching them to read and write in French. Uh, and then for, uh, for Korean, because my Korean is basic, I, I can't read and write because it's not that difficult to read and write in Korean. It's just different symbols. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, uh, they, now they attend a Korean school. Oh, so cool. they, it's assisting them as well. They, so my elders doesn't really enjoy it. Because it's a lot, it's very serious, a lot of repetitions and uh, reading, writing, not always in a very fun way. So, but I tell him, okay, just learn during the lesson, then we use the same things and we do something fun with it. Uh, and so I, I think maybe for Korean, what I do is just repeat it with different games. Mm -hmm. uh, and and for French, I do it like a hundred percent, so they don't have any other inputs for French. So, how much time do you spend on it per week? But I, I so I don't really teach formally. Like, okay, so for this mm -hmm. ne next thirty minutes or next hour or whatever, we're going to do this. Uh, it's generally included into games and mm -hmm. a routine. So, when the only routine we have. It's really bedtime stories. Mm -hmm. So at night, I read them books or we read together or sometimes my elders reads us a book. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we don't really mind the language. Just if it's Korean, my wife needs to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, French and English, uh, we can do it. Uh, and we read every evening. Mm -hmm. And that's really... Well, first, it's a good moment we spend together because mm. I, I, the whole day I'm in school teaching. Mm. And when I come home, that's like we have uh, bath time and dinner, etc. So that's our little moment that we know we're going to have every day. Um, and yeah, we read. So maybe it's for like 20 minutes every day. And then, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily French. And then on the weekend, we have a bit more time. Mm -hmm. So we do different games, but I try to always include at least one game uh, to play with like reading or writing. Oh. And the same, it takes maybe 20 minutes. So all together over a week. Uh, <laughs> He's maybe <counting> now. <laughs> two hours. <laughs> two hours. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Wow. Amazing. So what just um, came to my mind when we were talking about Korean, so I have a similar issue with my eldest. She does not enjoy Greek school that much. Um, she she likes it fine while she's there. So when she comes out, she's in a good mood. It's not like ah, anything good. bad really happens there. So she enjoys that. But, you know, she has to do homework because repetition and yeah. she hates that. Um, ah. And the homework is very 
very my, my children don't go to a um, regular traditional school they go to a montessori school so they're ah. used to a very different style of learning too oh yeah it must be so different it's very different because then all of a sudden she sits in this classroom for one and a half hours you know where there's the teacher up front with the blackboard and you know they get stickers and stuff all stuff that you know doesn't exist in a montessori system um, and she gets corrected a lot, which in the Montessori system in that way does not exist either, uh, right? Yeah. So she gets told off for not writing clearly on the line. Yeah. Which is, I mean, come on. Yeah, so but, she becomes a bit negative about yes, it. Yes, completely, yeah. completely. Um, and like, I don't care where she writes, you know, above the line, below the line. Yeah. As long as she writes, I don't care, you know? Yeah. Um, and she gets really upset because she wants to do a good job and she wants it to be perfect. Um, what I find really helps, uh, with, um, the Greek. So, you know, my, my Greek is from the sounds of it, my Greek is better than your Korean. Um, yeah. but <laughs> there is still a lot to learn from me. Like there's, you know, there's a long way up for me to be fluent in Greek. Um, I have a very good passive knowledge, but my active knowledge, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm taking it out now and I'm improving it now. So what I do, I do the homework with her. Like oh, it's yeah, yeah. our thing because I learn too. So yeah. I don't do it with her. So it's not like I sit down and I watch her. No, we both do the exact same exercise three oh, times yeah. because, you know, we have to write the same words for three times so that she can get tested on them the next day. Uh, all things she's not used to, but she's doing them anyways. And it's our time together. I massively benefit from it because, you know, Greek has like three different eyes. So, you know, how do you know which I to write when? And my daughter and I, we have the same struggle. Like, I don't know which one to write, you know? Um, so she really enjoys this time together. Yeah. She loves that she can correct my pronunciation. Yeah. She loves that, you know, my writing is not perfect either. So there is so much benefit in so many different levels. Yeah, I so, think it's, it's great because your daughter can see you as a learner as well. Yes. And then she became, becomes less ashamed to make her yes. own mistakes. Yes. When I do this with my son, because my, my vocabulary is really poor in, in Korean. So his vocabulary is good. My vocabulary is poor, but I can read and write better than him. Oh, okay. But also he hears the sounds better than me. Yeah, so sometimes I say, do you say that way or that way? He yeah. says, okay, that way. So, okay, no, so it's not that letter, it's that letter. <laughs> and so we, we complement each other. Yeah, amazing. And so I think that's helping him as well to be a bit more mm. enthusiastic. Mm. But yeah, but in, in class, he, because it's online lessons, I'm oh, right next to too. him and I can see him like being bored and I'm saying, sit straight. And <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you do it with him, the online lesson? Uh, I can be sitting next to him, but because I don't understand what's going on, oh, I think it would okay. be more di distracting for yeah. him and for yeah. the teacher and others who are going to yeah, hear sure. me. So yeah, I'm, sure. yeah, makes sense. Amazing. But you're doing an amazing job supporting this at home and doing French at home and doing the reading and writing to. at home. So you actually wrote a book about that. Yeah. Tell us about so, the book. So it's called uh, The Parents' Guide to Raising Multilateral Children. Uh, and it's, so it's mainly based off what I observed. So as a teacher of languages or foreign languages, uh, so I took a lot from that, my upbringing as a bilingual uh, child who learned the minority language in a, in a sec, um, supplementary school. Uh, so, so you know how to read and write in Japanese? So I know, but <laughs> I had a, so when I was in France uh, and learning to read and write in Japanese, it was taught to me as it would have been taught to a, a person living in Japan. Okay. And so when you live in the country, there is a lot of knowledge you get passively. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the spelling or, or like just practice, you can practice everywhere because everywhere is written in that language. With the minority language, mm. you don't get that reinforcement. Uh, and, and also I always got reading and writing just in school. Mm -hmm. So which gave me quite a, not, well, not negative, but 
certainly not positive <laughs> image of reading yeah. writing. Okay. It was quite difficult. So I had a difficult time growing up trying to learn to read and write. Uh, and because of my teaching training in England, I learned it could be done in different ways. It doesn't have to be the traditional way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can be done through games, etc. And I started to implement this with my children. Uh, and so all these observations I've made mm -hmm. helped me teach my children, especially my eldest who was really reluctant at the beginning because like, he doesn't like to fail. And I think that's something that's mm. taught to our children through school because they compare themselves to others, mm. etc. Um, so yeah, so all this, and I, I thought, so there are not, there are no books at the moment about this. Mm -hmm. So maybe if I write it, so if I show other parents how they can help their children, uh, I think that it could be helpful. And so I wrote this book when they are not just to, like activities they can do, but I try to explain the logic behind. Mm. So why do we do this activity and mm -hmm. what's the aim of it and what your child needs to know to be able to access this? There's also a part about what it means to, to learn a minority language, to, to read and write a minority language. So psychologically, emotionally, because it's a lot about that as well. Mm. And also when we're, when our children are in school, they are surrounded by other children learning the same thing. So they basically have to do it mm -hmm. at home. There is no one around. So if they don't want to do it, no one is doing it. Mm. So I try to show how you can leverage their interest mm -hmm. to teach different things. Uh, so all the book is about, so focusing on the interest of your child and making it fun so that they want to carry on Amazing. reading and writing. Amazing. Where can we get the book? So it's on Amazon, uh, oh. on any Amazon in the world. Oh. And there's a paperback version, a Kindle version as well. Amazing. That's really nice. Yoshito, I think we could keep talking for another hour probably <laughs> at least. There's so many interesting aspects and angles to the stories. Is there anything that you would like to add to this? Is there any question that I should have asked you that I didn't? Anything that matters to you that you would like to pass on to people listening? I think, so when we want to raise children with diff with multiple languages, uh, it's often easy to get in the into the position of, oh yeah, this person who is speaking the same language is doing this, my child is not doing it, and starting comparing. Mm. I think it's it's difficult, but we have to make sure we don't compare mm. our children to others, whether they are monolingual, bilingual, multilingual, mm. uh, because they all have the different uh, qualities. Mm. And if we leverage these qualities, they'll be able to do amazing things. Yes. And for example, for reading and writing with my with my eldest, once I started playing with games he liked it went a lot better. Now he's an avid reader. He keeps reading everything. So now it's quite easy, but at the beginning it was really difficult. And so yeah, this leads me to the second point is that it's it's a, a long process and you might not see the progress yes. from day to day, or from week to week or yes. from month to month. But when you look back at what they yes. used to do uh, or used to be able to do, uh, you can see that there is a big progress. Yes. So, yeah. This I is love that. I love that last part. I just had a conversation like that um, with a bunch of parents I'm working with at the moment um, who would like to see all the results right now. And I always say, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And it yeah. will pay off. Yeah. It will pay off eventually. Yeah. Amazing. Yoshito, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your stories and thank for sharing it with us. Everybody go buy that book if you want your children to be bio multiliterate. I will link it in the show notes, of course, so you can go and get it from there. Thank you so much. We'll stay in touch on Instagram. Um, thank you very and much. Go and follow him on Instagram. You will, <laughs> you will learn a lot from the account as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
so schön, dass du dabei warst. Hat dir die heutige Folge gefallen? Dann hinterlass mir doch super gerne einen Kommentar oder eine Bewertung auf iTunes oder in deiner bevorzugten Podcast-App. So wird mein Podcast Multilingual Stories noch mehr Menschen angezeigt und es werden noch mehr Menschen dazu inspiriert, ihre Sprachen in vollen Zügen zu genießen und auszuleben. Ich danke dir von Herzen. 